Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, there is another big Canadian bank scandal with RBC firing its chief financial officer. We're going to talk about that today. Also, unemployment was up in Canada, down in the U.S. How is our latest jobs report going to affect the Bank of Canada rate decision? What's going on with the EV demand? It's just falling off a cliff, Ask Tesla and Ford. And the federal government is stepping in to help the provinces combat short-term rentals. Today is Monday, April the 8th, 2024. Let's get started with today's top stories. As if there hasn't been enough bad news lately for the, the big banks here in Canada, news broke this past weekend that the Royal Bank has fired its chief financial officer, Nadine Ahn, um, after an internal in, uh, review concluded that she was in what they're calling an undisclosed close personal relationship with another employee that violated the bank's code of conduct. Uh, business will carry on though, and Catherine Gibson, who is a long-term uh, Royal Bank employee, she was named interim CFO and a search will be held for a permanent replacement. The bank said that it was recently made aware of allegations involving Ms. On and immediately launched an internal review and they engaged outside legal counsel to investigate. In a statement, the bank said, the investigation found evidence that in contravention to the RBC code of conduct, Ms. On was in an undisclosed close personal relationship with another employee, which led to preferential treatment of the employee, including promotion and compensation increases. Now, both On and the other employee who wasn't identified in the bank statement, they were fired. And importantly, according to the statement that RBC put out, they say the investigation found no evidence of conduct by the former CFO or the other employee with respect to the bank's previously issued financial statements, RBC strategy, or its financial or business performance. Now, on joined uh, Royal Bank back in 1999, she worked in a series of roles before being named CFO uh, in September of 2021. Now, this is notable because at the time, she was the only female CFO at any of the big six Canadian banks. She earned $4.1 million in direct compensation uh, in fiscal 2023. That includes a $650,000 salary, plus more than $3.4 million in bonuses and stock awards. That was an increase of about 25% from the previous year. Now, Royal Bank's annual proxy circular, it states that if any one of its top, top executives is terminated for cause, the bank will not pay severance, and the employee could also forfeit various other bonus awards. The Bank of Canada will be making its next interest rate in a couple of days on Wednesday of this week. The latest jobs numbers that have come in from Stats Canada, that's going to just sort of add to the bank's data set. As it tries to figure out what to do with the key rate, if not this month, sort of in the next a short while here, in March, Canada's unemployment rate rose to 6.1%, and that is up from February's 5.8%, and that now marks the, the largest monthly gain uh, since 2022. Stats Canada reported there was a net loss of 2,200 jobs here in Canada, and that came in obviously a number far below expectations. The expectations were that there would be a creation of 25,000 jobs, the difference here was driven by an increase in the number of individuals searching for work uh, or temporarily being laid off, notably impacting young people aged 15 to 24 whose unemployment rate reached 12.6%, and that's the highest rate now since September of 2016, um, excluding the, uh, the pandemic years. So with this latest information here, there is an anticipation that the rate cut of the bank has been intensified, sort of fueled by the various eco uh, economic indicators, which are signaling that there is a strain uh, or the strain, I guess, of the impact of the higher interest rates that we've seen over the last a year or two years or so. And that includes a uh, rise in business bankruptcies and a decrease in job vacancies. Now, despite the strong wage growth here, there, there's an average hourly wage increase of 5.1% from the previous year. And economists are predicting at this point a unemployment rate of 6.5% by the third quarter. Now, in contrast to this news in the U.S. labor market, it showed very strong performance in March. The addition of 303,000 jobs and a dip in their unemployment rate to 3.8% that's down from 3.9%. In fact, job gains there have averaged 276,000 per month in the first quarter, and that outpaces the, the third quarter, Q4 of 2023. This job growth has come mostly, or actually it's come from across various industries, including healthcare, government, construction, and leisure and hospitality. And that just sort of goes to highlight the US economy's broad-based growth that we're seeing right now. So in the US, we've got the labor market's resilience here, and that paints a sort of a promising picture of economic stability, growth potential, 
Not so much here in Canada. The labor, mar labor market is obviously continuing to struggle, uh, and that's made worse by rapid population growth um, and challenges in the job creation, particularly for our young Canadians. Looking for a balanced investment option that can help you grow your money and provide you cash flow? Check out the BMO Balanced ETF. This is a fund that invests in other BMO ETFs that cover global stocks and bonds. The BMO Balanced ETF, it adjusts its portfolio every three months to keep an optimal mix of assets. So you will get exposure to a wide range of markets and sectors through low cost index ETFs and you pay only one management fee. The BMO Balanced ETF is ideal for investors who want a mix of growth and cash flow with a professional touch from BMO Global Asset Management. Don't miss this opportunity to invest in a balanced fund that works for you. The BMO Balanced ETF, a smart way to help you diversify your portfolio. Visit BMOETFs.com today and find out more. The electric vehicle industry is going through quite a pivotal point right now and is facing challenges that have more recently come to light through the struggles of major players in the industry like Tesla and even in more traditional companies like Ford. If we look at Tesla's latest earnings report, it has been described as an unmitigated disaster by a number of analysts and we've seen the company stock down around 30% so far this year. That now marks the worst quarter since 2002. But the downturn isn't isolated only to Tesla. It reflects more the broader issues that we're seeing within the EV market itself. Things like slowing demand, we've heard a lot about that, logistical hurdles and a higher production costs. As another example, Ford, they responded to the challenges by delaying the production of new all electric vehicles. They're gonna be focusing more on hybrid vehicles and they plan to offer hybrid uh, options across its entire North American lineup by 2030. So this shift here, um, it comes sort of amidst this slower than expected EV adaptation and the financial strain of transitioning to electric vehicles. An example here again is Ford's Model E electrical electric vehicle business, which has been reporting substantial losses. The developments indicate uh, the inability of the market, which is characterized by increasingly competitive landscape. Uh, for example, it went from uh, eight EV models back in 2020 to 53 in 2023. Um, yet it has been hampered by significant adoption barriers, costs, range limitations, insufficient infrastructure, and the scarcity of raw material. They continue to restrict the, the broader market penetration. In addition to this, there's obviously the rising borrowing costs have made consumers quite wary of investing in the new, uh, typically pricier EVs compared with the traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. Now, despite these hurdles here, the future of the EV market, there it does hold good growth potential. A lot of that is driven by the governmental initiatives like Canada's goal for um, all new vehicles to be zero emissions by the year 2035. And also, of course, China's booming EV market. In response to Canada's ongoing housing crisis, the federal government now has introduced measures that are aimed at discouraging short-term rentals or STRs, especially those that are not adhering to local regulations. So these measures, they were detailed in the 2023 federal economic statement. They're intended to make more housing units available for long-term rentals by making the STR business a, certainly as a less attractive model. Notably here, the government's efforts, they target the denial of expenses for STRs that operate outside of local compliance. And this will potentially increase the taxable income quite substantially for um, these property owners. The growing number of STRs has led to a number of regulatory responses at both the municipal and provincial lim uh, levels, and that aims to limit their impact by imposing restrictions um, on the operations of these STRs. They often include restrictions that they belong to the operator's primary residence. We've certainly seen that here in British Columbia, and that will then sort of have the effect of capping the number of properties that one can rent out, uh, and also stipulating limits on rental durations and tenant capacities. The proposed federal tax legislation introduces a direct a financial disincentive for non-compliant STR operators by denying income tax deductions for expenses that are occurring heard by these rentals. The logic here is quite straightforward. If you remove the ability to deduct expenses from the rental income, then the net income, and thus the tax liability of the STR operators is going to increase, and it makes non-compliance less fi uh, financially viable. The Department of Finance says these proposed rules apply to STRs which are non-compliant, meaning not permitted to operate due to applicable municipal or provincial regulations. So one of the biggest challenges here is that enforcement will essentially rely on the accurate identification of non-compliant rentals 
on the local authority's capacity to uh, enforce the regula regulations effectively. So we're going to have to see how effective this is, the government's strategy to alleviate the housing crisis through uh, this additional taxation of non-compliant STRs. It is a material, it's a noteworthy step, but its success will largely depend on the enforcement of local regulations. So for STR operators, this kind of just underscores the importance of understanding first and then complying with the various municipal and provincial rules. Please don't forget to subscribe to our Pulse newsletter that goes out every weekend. And if you haven't done so, you can visit our Investing Academy. I will put a link for both the newsletter and the Academy in the description of this video. Uh, as always, thank you for watching this video and we'll see you back here on Wednesday.